excellent. So, today in lecture, and you will really need to quiet down, otherwise you won't hear anything at the back. Okay, perfect. Um, today in lecture, we are going to talk about the composition of the intrasolar and extrasolar fluid, and what the composition or the differences in composition, what types of phenomena, which are quite important both for um, cellular biology and physiology, etc., etc., arise based on these differences. So that's the, uh, that's the plan for today. We are going to talk about some phenomena stuff uh, that some of you, most of you have heard about. Okay, hopefully we'll go a little bit deeper or it will give you or us an opportunity to talk about some of the principles maybe, well, it, it can allow us to maybe explain some things in more detail than there have been previously. So in this lecture we should have reasonable amount of time. Um, so do ask questions because it is much more important from specifically from this lecture, that you take away the principles and understanding of what is going on rather than some specific facts, okay? So the facts are not, well, I mean, they are important, but I mean, you can find them anywhere, okay? But it's more important that you understand what actually goes on. Right. Um, when we talk about bodily fluid, if we take the whole thing, so all the, the fluid as, uh, that is in our body, we can quite logically uh, divide it into, into intracellular and extracellular fluid. So as a cell, whatever, all sorts of things in the cell, and of course the fluid which is inside is going to be the intracellular fluid and whatever is outside of the cell is going to be extracellular fluid. The extracellular fluid is then further divided into fluid which is inside blood vessels, which is called intravascular. So the rest of it is extracellular fluid. Yeah, we said that. Um, the one which is in blood vessels or potentially in all vessels, so that would include lymph vessels, but let's leave that aside, it's not that important. Okay, so mostly blood vessels. So this will be intravascular fluid. Whatever is outside of the blood vessels would be extravascular fluid. Yeah, that makes sense. And the stuff which is in between, so it's outside of the cells, but it's not in the blood vessels, we usually call interstitial fluid. Interstitial. Okay. So this is just a subdivision of the types of, we can say, compartments, because, of course, all these types of fluid, they communicate with each other based on some principles. In some tissues, they communicate more. In other tissues, they communicate less. And we'll talk about that in quite some detail in, in uh, future lectures. But we do have these individual compartments which are actually quite important, namely because their composition differs. Now, the way I drew the cell here is the way that most people imagine a cell. There's a plasma membrane, there are some organelles, and these organelles are floating in cytosol, okay, or cytoplasm, depending on uh, what specific nomenclature you use. Um, but this is how most people imagine cells, and this is also what you find in most textbooks, that cells like, look like this. And then, what do we imagine as the intracellular fluid? We imagine that it is a, you know, more or less transparent, nice solution as if it was in a test tube or something like that. Now, have a look at the presentation. 
we'll just try to decrease. Yeah, hopefully. I will switch them on later, later on. So this is a 3D model of a bacterial cell. It's a very small bacterium called Mycoplasma genitalium. Uh, it's, I think it's one of the smallest bacteria that exist. Um, the, uh, the size of that is about 140, 145 nanometers. It's a tiny, tiny cell, okay? 10 times or less smaller than our cells, it's tiny. Um, it's also a very simple bacterium for whatever reasons. You'll talk about these bacteria in microbiology in later years. However, what I want to show you in this 3D model, because this is not a sort of an artist depiction, okay? Which is what you usually find that somebody looks at and draws a picture. But this is an actual 3D model based on the actual composition of this cell. So what they did was they measured the concentration of the various components, and then they created 3D models of these individual components. Um, and then they, based on these concentrations and these 3D mod models, they just put it all together. Uh, what I will say is that the only things that you will see in the model are proteins and nucleic acids. So all the small molecules, what we call small molecules, all the nutrients, water, electrolytes, and whatever, they're not there, okay? They would just complicate the model too much, okay? So all, everything that you will see are just macromolecules. So what you're looking at here is the cell membrane. So this is the cell membrane. The gray things are phospholipids, um, and the green things are proteins, okay? Proteins in the plasma membrane. But if we look inside, you see that the cytoplasm, which normally we imagine as this clear solution, is actually a really, really thick mixture of all sorts of macromolecules, namely, so these spaghetti or fusilli or whatever uh, shapes are nucleic acids, mostly DNA, um, and all these little blue uh, things are proteins. So this is a model of a bacterial cell, but our cells actually look very similar to this, obviously way more complicated, way, many more proteins, much more organized and or organized in different ways. But this is what cytoplasm actually looks like. It's a very, very thick solution of proteins, macromolecules, and, and small molecules together. In fact, and I will switch it off because otherwise you will spend the whole lecture just looking at the, uh, at the video. Switch that off as well. Yes? The, the nucleic acids, the, like the nucleoid there. Yes, of course, they would be hidden in the nucleus, but the nucleus, mitochondria, whatever, the organelles are just separate compartments of this whole thing. So yes, of course, if you just went through, you wouldn't immediately see the DNA. It would be differently organized. But what I really, really wanted to show you that it's really packed, these, the cytoplasm in this case, including nucleic acids, is tightly packed. Now, you would see in a, uh, in a mammalian cell, you would see nucleic acids because there are nucleic acids, there's RNA in, in, in cytoplasm, so you would see them, but of course the organization would be different. Yes, so you're right, uh, but it doesn't make a huge difference um, to the description. So if we look at mammalian cytoplasm and we look at the concentration of proteins, just proteins, none of the other molecules, uh, just proteins, we see normally that the concentration of proteins is about 100 grams per liter. Okay, so it's about 10% protein solution. Um, which may not, I don't know, maybe it sounds like a lot, maybe it doesn't sound like a lot. I, I'm not sure what your frame of reference is, but it's actually a huge amount. Uh, this is the concentration of proteins that you find in egg white. Okay, so when you break an egg and you see the egg white, which is it's a relatively thick liquid, okay, it doesn't, definitely doesn't flow easily, okay, unless you break it up or something. So this is what our cytoplasm actually looks like, sort of, okay? So the concentration of proteins is about that. But 
in addition to all the proteins, we have all the other components, all the small molecules, okay? All the ions, all the nutrients, all the um, metabolic uh, pathway intermediates, etc. All right? So this, what I, wanted to sh what I wanted to get in your head is that despite the fact that we often talk about the cytoplasm as a dilute aqueous solution, and we do that to simplify things, because if we wanted to do calculations and chemistry and whatever using this super complicated environment, it would be really difficult. So we simplify by saying, yeah, okay, it's basically just a solution of sodium chloride or something like that. But it definitely isn't, okay? And this is what I wanted to show. Good. Let's now have a look at what the composition of the intracellular fluid and extracellular fluid looks like, but we will focus mostly on the small molecules. Now, when I say small molecules, I mean not proteins, not nucleic acids, not polymers, okay? All the other things, even though sometimes they're really big molecules, okay, we call them small molecules because they're not proteins. Okay, or not polymers. So just so you know, when, when I say small molecules, that doesn't mean just water, but yeah, not protein. Right, so let's now focus on the, uh, on the small molecules and the small molecule composition of the intracellular, extra, extracellular fluid, and let's see in what ways they are similar and in what ways they are different, because it's the differences that will be um, interesting. Now for the extracellular fluid, The values in the composition of the extracellular fluid are something that some of you will already be familiar with. And if not, you will be required to learn most of them or many of them, okay? The reason is that we use them in medicine, right? We measure concentrations of various ions or various nutrients or breakdown products or whatever in the blood and the blood is pretty much at least a part of the extracellular fluid. So those are the values we expect you to know. The intracellular values, we will use some of them in the future, but we will not expect you to know the exact concentration of glucose inside the cell. Also because it differs depending on which, what kind of cell you look at, okay? Good. So if we start with some of the smallest molecules, so to speak, or actually individual atoms, um, which are ions, okay? Or sometimes we call them electrolytes, which is this old historic nomenclature, okay? Just, I, I use it because you will see it in textbooks and you will hear people talking about electrolytes, but there are ions, okay? So what kind of ions can we find in whatever extracellular or intracellular fluid? And let's start with cations. So what, can, what, what, would, be, what would be the major cation of the extracellular fluid? Sodium, perfect. So sodium is definitely the major cation of the extracellular fluid and the concentration is approximately? 50%. 50%. Approximately 140 millimoles per liter. Not quite 50%. Uh, but if you meant that it's 50% of the cations, uh, yeah, even that is not true. Uh, but anyway. <laughs> but anyway, so sodium is the major extracellular cation. What does it look like in the intracellular fluid? Is there more of it, less of it? Okay, a lot less? A lot less, okay. So the value that is often, and again, with the intracellular fluid, it really depends on what kind of cell we're looking at. Okay, so I will write some numbers but they may actually differ from one cell type to another, okay? So don't take them that, that that's the value that you will find everywhere, okay? So let's say it's about 12, okay? So it's about 10 times less, 12 millimolar inside the cell. Good. What would be uh, the second most important cation, whether in the intracellular or extracellular fluid? Potassium. potassium, definitely. Potassium. What concentration would you expect in the extracellular fluid, let's say in the blood, approximately? Any idea? That's a little high. 4 to 5, yeah, that's pretty good. Okay, so 4 to 5. I'm going to put 4.5. <laughs> 
millimoles per liter. Okay. What about inside the cell? 140, 150, depending where you look, but yeah, let's put 140 so that it's easier to remember, okay? So these two cations, sodium potassium, kind of swap places almost uh, when we are inside or outside. And as we'll see in a second, that has some very important implications. All right, what other cations would you expect to find, whether outside or inside the cell? Major ones. Hmm? Sorry, uh, this calcium, magnesium. Okay, so calcium is definitely, definitely an important one um, because it has very important signaling functions, as we'll mention in future lectures. Any idea what the concentration of calcium is approximately outside of the cell? Outside of the cell? Two to three, yeah, that's pretty good. Okay, 2.5 millimolar. Okay, we're still in the millimolar range, um, so thereabouts. What about inside the cell? It's definitely less than one millimolar, yeah. It's about 1,000 times less than outside, approximately, again, depending on the specific cell. Okay, so we'd be looking somewhere at micromolar or even lower concentrations. Okay, so I would put around one micromolar, but it can be even less, okay? So don't take this as a, and it also changes depending on what the cell is doing. Uh, but there is a lot less calcium inside than outside. Good. Well, this is micromolar, okay? Right, uh, there was a mention of magnesium, definitely an important one. The, the differences outside, inside are not that important for other things, so I will not mention what magnesium. Hmm? Well, then we have proteins, uh, that is true, but I thought we were still talking about cations. They can be positively charged. They can be positively charged. But if we take proteins as a whole, they are primarily negatively charged. So proteins are usually mentioned among the anions because on average, proteins in our body tend to be negatively charged. But you're absolutely right, of course, there are proteins that are mostly positively charged, but proteins are usually given as anions, okay? Um, if we look at proteins, I'm not gonna give you, uh, well, I mean, we spoke about the concentration inside the cell, which is about 100 grams per liter, very, very, very high. In the extracellular fluid, is it going to be higher or lower? higher protein concentration in the extracellular fluid, it's going to be a lot lower, okay? I mean, imagine if, even if we just spoke about the blood, imagine if blood was as thick as an egg white, it wouldn't really flow well through the blood vessels, okay? So it's definitely more dilute in this respect. There aren't that many proteins. But the concentration of proteins is the lowest in the interstitial fluid. So in the fluid which just bathes the cells, there the concentration of proteins is quite low, okay? In the blood, it's a bit higher. Inside the cell, it's a lot higher. All right, any other interesting cations? No, let's have a look at anions, okay? So we already mentioned proteins, fine, important. Um, what other important, what would be the, the most important anion? Definitely chloride, definitely chloride. Extracellularly, approximately. About 100, yeah. Again, millimolar, millimoles per liter. Inside the cell, a lot less, yes. I have here three, for whatever reason. <laughs> but anyway, it's, it's a lot less, okay. It's almost 100 times less inside the cell. There are exceptions to this and you will hear about them, I think, mostly in the second year, but there are places in the body where this is not quite true, okay? When the, the ratios are a bit different, okay? But let's leave it aside. This is gener generally true, okay? Um, any other important anions apart from chlorides? Chlorides definitely the most important ones. Hmm? Uh, carbonic acid, well, it, it's not carbonic acid. 
it's bicarbonate, okay? Carbonic acid basically doesn't exist, okay? Forget about carbonic acid, okay? The, the half-life of carbonic acid is about, is in nanoseconds, okay? It just doesn't exist. It doesn't, it practically doesn't exist. So bicarbonate is definitely it outside of the cell. Any idea? <laughs> yes. About 24, let's say, 24 millimolar. Uh, inside the cell, it's a little bit less, but not massively. Again, I'm not showing you the numbers here for you to write them down and memorize them, okay? They may differ and there are some ranges and there will be time for you to memorize them, not now. What I'm trying to show you is that there are, especially in some of these electrolytes, there are quite some significant differences. And we'll see in a second what these differences can actually produce, what they can, what they can give rise to. Now, in addition to these ions, and there are, of course, many more ions. So we mentioned magnesium, and, and there can be whatever, all sorts of other ions that we can find in very, much, much lower concentrations. But in addition to these and proteins, which are macromolecules, which are big molecules, obviously we would find all the other small molecules like glucose, urea, intermediates of, of various metabolic pathways, etc. And these would, their concentrations would differ depending on the situation both outside and inside of the body. Amino acids, etc., etc. So this is kind of an overview of what we can find in the ex intracellular and extracellular fluid. Any questions to that? That's just a list, really, so I wouldn't expect questions. Now, one of the interesting phenomena that this, especially the ionic composition or the differences in ionic composition between the intra and extracellular fluids gives rise to is a membrane potential. Now, maybe some of you have heard already that many cells in our body have an electric potential across their plasma membrane. The usual way it is, is that there is a slight negative charge inside the cell and a slight, well, or not so slight, positive charge outside of the cell. So if we put electrodes and we, we stick one inside the cell and the other one is outside, we can measure a voltage. Okay, just nod your head if that's something you've heard. I would expect you to have heard that, but yeah, okay, good. What gives rise to this potential difference? What gives rise to this voltage? The ion differences, the ion differences as I said before. But how does it work? Any ideas? Gradient. Well, yeah, it definitely is caused by the gradient. The sodium-potassium pump. Sodium -potassium pump is not the main driver of the membrane potential. It adds a little bit, okay, but it's not the major thing. ATP. Nope, ATP definitely not. I mean, that's related to ATP, to the uh, potassium sodium pump. Well, I will try to show you a very, 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 very simplified model of what gives rise to a membrane potential. It's simplified, so it, it, it doesn't really exist in any cell, but I think it gives a pretty good idea of how it comes about. You had a question? Yeah, but that's not really an explanation, is it? If you say diffusion causes it, okay? I want to, I want to get to the actual mechanism through which diffusion causes it, yeah? Well, you're getting closer to the explanation, but, but sodium plays no role in this, okay? So we have this cell, and in the beginning, there is no potential difference. We only have intracellular fluid of this composition, extracellular fluid of that composition. Do you have any question? No? All right. Um, 
What occurs in most cells is that at rest, in normal condition, their membrane is permeable for potassium. And this is crucial. It's not permeable for other ions. It's only permeable for potassium. So we have ion channels in the membrane which allow potassium to go in or out, not other ions. Again, this is a simplified model. Okay? In real cells, we have tons and tons of all the other ion channels, and it complicates things a little bit. Okay? But this is the, 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 the most important mechanism. So we have potassium channels, which are protein molecules, basically, which uh, allow only potassium to go in, a, in or out, okay? using some structures that you will talk about how that works. Um, so what happens? What happens if we have these ionic, uh, these differences in ionic composition um, and we have potassium channels open? What will happen? Sorry, you have to speak up a little bit. Like, can you explain again like, the question? The question is, we have a sack of fluid of this composition Inside the fluid of inside fluid of this composition, and through the sac, potassium ions can pass, one way or the other. It will. What will get into the cell? Okay, I'll repeat. Okay, only potassium can flow through. Okay, water may flow through as well, but that just follows. There is no membrane potential. It can't depolarize if there is no polarization. It will try to kill the amount of potassium. The question is, what will happen? Why? Because we are getting more positively charged particles in than out. Why? Why are we letting more positive charges in than out? What? So what will move across a concentration gradient and which way? So potassium ions will flow according to the concentration gradient. Which way? Okay, so who thinks they will flow inside, into the cell? Raise your hand. Lots of people said it. Now nobody's raising their hand. Okay, thank you. Who thinks they will flow outside of the cell? Yes, indeed. They will flow outside. Why? The concentration of potassium inside is 140 millimolar. And, inside, uh, and outside is only 4.5 millimolar. So the concentration gradient for potassium is, so inside is, is more and outside is less. So what will happen is the potassium ions will start to flow out. Now, of course, they won't just flow out, right? If you have any questions, ask me. I'm more likely to explain it well. No, I try to understand it. <laughs> okay. Uh, ask what you don't understand. No, uh, the... Uh the difference between the intracellular and the extracellular. So I try to understand why it, go, it goes out. Well, it goes out yeah. because there's more potassium here than there is here. And if the question is about the mechanism, how does potassium know that it should go out, right? I mean, it's just an ion. It doesn't have a brain. It can't measure anything, right? How does it know that it should be going out? Well, it doesn't. Okay, potassium has no idea. It's moving completely randomly. But since there are more potassium ions here than there are here, just through probability, the likelihood that a potassium ion will go out is higher than that it will go in. Right? So it's just about probability. Okay? The potassium knows nothing about uh, you know, what concentration it's in. It's not being pushed out through the other potassium ions or anything like that, okay? Um, it's a random process, and randomly speaking, the probabilities are higher for potassium to go in, okay? So, 
the potassium channels, they're not one-way channels, okay? The potassium can flow either way, and it will flow either way, okay? But overall, the net movement will be of potassium out. Good. So, what happens to the potential? What happens to the voltage on the membrane if this starts happening? Sorry, yeah? Okay, yeah. What will be equal? Well, first, before we get to the point that they are equal, that the concentrations are equal, okay, what will happen to the potential on the membrane? Yeah? One side will be more positive than the other. Yes, which one will be more positive than the other? Indeed. So we'll be starting to build negative charge inside the cell and positive charge, relative positive charge, outside of the cell, right? Because we're moving positively charged ions outside of the cell, so this becomes more and more negative and this becomes more and more positive. Yeah? Make sense? Because we said so. Or is your question about how, how comes that it ended up being like that? I'm not sure what your question is. Okay, well, there is a sodium potassium pump which keeps these differences between the extracellular and uh, intracellular fluid, okay? But it's a separate process, sort of separate process, to the origin of the membrane potential, okay? So these ion differences are given by transporters which keep these differences. Okay? R right. So, negative charge builds inside, sort of. It doesn't really build, it's just lack of positive charges, but you know what I mean. And outside, we have a positive charge. So, the, the membrane potential becomes more and more negative. Now, the question is, when will it stop? When will the movement of potassium ions stop? So, when the concentrations are the same inside and outside. Indeed, forget about sodium potassium pump. All right, so that's a logical answer to this question, okay? This movement of potassium ions will stop when there is no more gradient, right? When there's no difference in concentration, okay? That makes sense, but it's not true, okay? Yeah, do you have a different suggestion? Correct. The outflow of potassium ions will actually stop way before the concentrations are equalized, like way before then. And the reason why it stops is that as we keep building the negative charges, again, we're not really building negative charges, we're just removing positive charges, but hopefully we understand each other, right? So as the inside of the cell becomes more and more negative, at some point, well, the whole time, really, it will start attracting the positively charged potassium ions back in because there is an electric field, right? And the electric field is trying to pull, well, not just potassium, it's trying to pull everything, all the positively charged ions in, but only potassium can flow in, right? None of the other ones can flow in, yeah? So the electric field starts building up, pulling potassium back in. And at some point, these two forces, I'm going to say forces, the force of diffusion, it's not a real force, but you know what I mean, force of diffusion will equal the force of electric attraction. And at that point, the outflow of potassium will stop and we will get an equilibrium. Can you explain things? Well, you can imagine, it's not true, but you can imagine that there is a force pushing potassium out, and that's the force of concentration gradient. It's not, but you can imagine that, right? And as we are, as, as potassium flows out, the inside of the cell becomes more negative, electrically charged, negative, and there, there becomes an electric field which will start attracting these positively charged ions back in, okay? It's like, a, I don't know, if, if you have 
like Van de Graaff generator. I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with that, but but anyway, but there is an there is a negative charge which is which is attracting the positively charged ions back in, and these two forces. One, one is a real force, the other one not really, become equal at some point. And at that point, there is no overall force pushing or pulling the potassium ions in or out. And at that point, we will get to an equilibrium state when no more potassium flows in or flows out. No, it's, it's just a random, it's a random movement, okay? But this random movement which results in a net outflow of potassium will be sort of canceled out by the attractive force of the electric field, okay? So we'll get to an equilibrium, and this equilibrium occurs in our cells, occurs when the potential gets to minus 90 millivolts. So minus 90 millivolts is what we call an equilibrium or the equilibrium potential for potassium. So it won't go any further than minus 90. There it will stop. It's the equilibrium potential. It will not become more negative. Okay? Yes? Um, so the concentration of the intercellular fluid will stay around 140 at all times? It will. Actually, the amount of potassium which will be allowed to go out of the cell to reach minus 90 millivolts is tiny. We're talking about like 10,000 atoms or something like that. It's a tiny amount of potassium that flows out to get us to this point. So the intracellular, let alone the extracellular concentration, will not really change. You can't really measure that change. Okay. Now, for those of you who are comfortable with physics, you can calculate what it really, I mean, depending if, if you know the size of the cell, et cetera, you can really calculate the number of ions needed to produce this relatively large voltage is really, really, really small, okay? So just so you know, and, and thanks for the question, the actual concentration of ions in the cell, in the cell doesn't really change macroscopically, yeah. Well, as I just said, when they start flowing out, the concentration doesn't really change because the numbers are, are tiny, okay? So at equilibrium, yes, it's going to be approximately the same. This, this is what you actually find in our body, okay? If you measure concentration of potassium inside the cell, it's going to be 140, 150, if you measure it outside. So it's at equilibrium, I guess, yeah. It's, 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 these are the real concentrations. Okay? They don't really change through this process. Yeah, we talked theoretically about before about diffusion, that they, um, they're trying to reach an equilibrium only yeah. by diffusion, yes. but then the attraction of the yes. electricity, so that's, that's equilibrium. Those numbers are at the equilibrium. Well, they are the same before or after the process, because the numbers of ions are very, very, very tiny that move around. So, yes, they are at equilibrium, but they're also in the beginning ish. I'm not entirely sure where your question is heading, but maybe in the break we, we can clarify that. Yeah, I'm not sure you did, and that's why we can, yeah, we can, anyway, yes? So, this is the equilibrium potential of potassium. If this model, if cells were following this model, every cell would, be, would stop at minus 90, okay? Now, almost no cell in our body has minus 90 millivolts as a potential. And the reason is that real cells have lots of other ion channels and transporters and sodium potassium pumps, et cetera, et cetera. So the real potential is given by way more complicated model, okay? So this is a super simplified one which gets us pretty close to the actual potential. So the actual potential of our cells is, let's say, minus 60 all the way to minus 85 or something like that, okay? So we're close, okay? Just by using potassium, 
Okay? But you're right, our cells are way more complicated and we basically never reach minus 90. Or that's, that's not a normal membrane potential for any cell. I mean, resting membrane potential. Good. Any questions about membrane potential? This very simplified model of how it comes about. Is it, is it clear? It's actually a really simple explanation of how it comes about. We start with composition differences, ion composition differences. We punch holes which allow only one type of ions to go through, and we're done. We get a potential. Yeah. I would, well, probably not because there's the, because the potential is really only felt across the membrane. It really it exists only sort of across the membrane. So I don't think it actually, I, I don't think so, but I'm not sure. I don't think so. Good. A phenomenon which is quite closely related to the establish, uh, establishment of the, of the membrane potential is a phenomenon called osmosis. Okay? It's a different thing, but it's sort of related. Can somebody tell me what osmosis is? Yep. Concentration of what? Oh, okay, okay. Semipermeable membrane. Okay. So osmosis generally is defined as the movement of the solvent. We're mostly talking about water, of course, okay, but of the solvent through a semipermeable membrane from an environment where the concentration of the solvent is higher to an environment where it's lower. Okay? So it's sort of related to all these things that we talk about, but this time we're talking about the movement of, let's say, water. Okay, let's use, because mostly we'll be using water anyway. Um, so we have a semi-permeable membrane, and we have two chambers, whatever. Um, in both of them, there are water molecules. Okay, so both of the chambers are filled with water. But into one of them, we add some solute. Whatever. Okay, some solute. Something, something dissolved. Now, what will happen? Water will start flowing from, in this case, pure water, but it doesn't have to be pure. Okay. And the water molecules will start flowing into the area where there is a sort of lower concentration of water, but higher concentration of the solute. Does this make sense? Is this something you've seen before, you understand what osmosis actually is? Now, this flow, this flow of water molecules will cause an increase of pressure in this compartment, right? Does it make sense? Water is flowing in, so the pressure in this compartment is going to go up, and this pressure is called osmotic pressure. Now, how does it work? Uh, well, before we, get, before we get to how it works, and then we'll take a short break, um, let me just give you an expression how to calculate osmotic pressure. Now, the formula that I'll write down is not, you don't need to memorize it, we won't really use it for anything, okay? But I just want to show it to you because it gives you a, an important characteristic of osmotic pressure or osmotic ph phenomena. So osmotic pressure, which is capital Pi, is equal to K times T times C. K is what we call a Boltzmann constant, okay, something from st statistical thermodynamics. You don't really need to know that. T is the thermodynamic temperature, temperature in Kelvin, okay? So, 
the osmotic pressure, osmotic phenomena will change with temperature. And finally, C is the concentration. Now, concentration of what? It's the concentration of solutes. I mean, it's the concentration difference, really. Okay, so it's the concentration of difference. But if we assume, just for the sake of simplicity, we assume that here we have pure solvent, okay, and here we have a solution, then this would be the concentration in the solution. But really, it's the concentration difference. Okay, now, what I want to stress here is that the osmotic pressure does not depend on what kind of solute it is it doesn't care, okay? So the solute can be charged or uncharged, it could be organic or it could be inorganic, it doesn't care. Any kind of particle which is dissolved will create, at the same concentration, will create the same osmotic pressure, okay? And this is really important because oftentimes when we, at an exam or whatever, when we ask students, what is osmosis, they will say, well, it's the phenomenon where ions at attract a solvent or whatever, okay? No, it's any kind of solute. It's anything that is dissolved will create that, and it doesn't depend on the size of the molecule, it doesn't depend on the charge of, on the, of the molecule, okay? It will, any kind of dissolved particle will create the same osmotic pressure. Important. Concentration of the solute, in this case, of what is dissolved, okay? But it, it would really be, if we have two, sol two uh, solutions, then it would be the difference in concentrations, just so you know. How does it work? The usual explanation, the explanation that you find in textbooks, and it's the explanation that I used to give, until I found out that it's wrong, <laughs> is basically diffusion, right? As we said before, here is a higher concentration of water, and water will, through diffusion, through random movement, diffuse into the compartment where there is less water, so to speak, okay? An easy explanation, everybody uses it, okay? Apparently it's wrong, and the reason why it's wrong is that this would work for a gas. So if we were in a gaseous state, in an ideal gas, this explanation would be correct. However, water is not gas, and it attracts, the molecules attract to each other and also repulse each other. They, they basically act, they have forces uh, between uh, the molecules. And that means that the best explanation for what is going on here is that basically the pressure that the molecules of water are exerting on each other here is higher than it is here because, sort of, because the, the molecules of the solute are pulling the molecules towards them, the molecules of water towards them, and therefore the pressure that these water molecules are exerting on each other is smaller. And really, this literally creates the pressure difference which pushes this water here, okay? You don't really need to know this explanation. No one will ask you about it, probably in your whole life, okay, I would imagine. Um, I just want to tell you that the usual explanation through diffusion is probably, from a physical point of view, is probably incorrect. That's not the right uh, explanation. Of course, there are explanations based on thermodynamics, which are perfectly correct, uh, but they are so abstract that I don't think there's any point using them, yes? can be electrical, can be through, you know, polar parts of the molecules, can be through other types of forces. If the, if the molecule is not polar, it's like... Um, it still, still works. It still, still works. works. It still works. Okay? It's a little bit more complex. So, when I said here that it's really the molecules of solute that are pulling things in, this was for you to, so to make it easier to kind of, you know, see it in front of your eyes, okay? The actual physical explanation is, is more complicated. So it, these molecules don't have to be, these particles don't have to be charged, they don't have to be polar, it still will work. Okay, yes? Say again? Can we use concentration gradient to describe 
I'm not sure what you mean. So if, we ask, if I said, what is osmosis, and you would write concentration gradient. Probably, yeah. It's probably not, yeah, I guess. But you, have, you would have to specify concentration of what, okay? So if it is concentration gradient of the solvent, then you're correct. If it is of the solute, then it works the other way around. There was one other, yes? So osmotic pressure is, re I mean, really, osmotic pressure is this pressure which is pushing water to the other side, okay? But how we measure osmotic pressure is usually when we get an equilibrium, we will find that there will be higher pressure here than here, and the pressure difference would be the osmotic pressure. Okay, and there is connection between osmolarity and Absolutely. So osmolarity, and I heard from my colleagues that this is something that some people struggle with. Osmolarity is just a molar concentration of all the osmotically active particles in the solution. That's it. There's nothing. So it's this, it's this concentration only you take all the individual particles together. So it doesn't matter what they are, you just count them. Okay? This is important because, for example, if we have a solution of sodium chloride, and we know that sodium chloride in an aqueous solution dissociates into sodium ions and, and chloride and ions, that means that from one compound we have two particles. So we have to multiply by two. So all the individual particles put together, expressed as a molar concentration, is osmolarity. What? No, 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 no. There's, if the concentration is higher, pressure is higher. Good. Let's take a three minute break. Three minutes? Okay, just go to the loo, drink something, and we'll start. All right. So, just to, I mean, there were lots of, lots of questions during the break. Um, so I just wanted to maybe clarify or say again, because maybe it was kind of lost, but the pressure which is exerted, the osmotic pressure is exerted by the less concentrated solution. So by the, by the water which is pushing into the more concentrated solution, just to be clear what we're talking about, okay? So the pressure is really from the pure solvent or from the less concentrated solution to the more concentrated solution. That's why I said it, that you have to specify what concentration gradient you're talking about, okay? Because the concentration gradient of the solvent is opposite to the concentration gradient of the solute, right? Good. Now, let's move on to the last uh, topic for today, which is pH and buffers. Again, something that you've seen many, many times, okay? Something hopefully you've mastered. Uh, but we'll go through some of the things and maybe some of them we will uh, go into more detail uh, than is normal. So in biochemistry, and especially in human biochemistry, we mostly use the Brenstead theory of acid bases. So that means that we take an acid to be proton donor, okay? And a base is a proton acceptor. As you know, there are other theories, or yeah, other theories, I guess, of acidity. Some of them are used in organic chemistry and are very useful, okay? But we will be using really this uh, theory. So we'll be talking about protons. We'll be talking about protonolytic reactions, okay? So an acid will release a proton, a base will accept a proton. Now, we talk about, in kind of normal speech, we talk about strong acids and weak acids, and we talk about strong bases and weak bases. How can we distinguish, or how do we define the difference between them? Yes? The number of reactions. The, the, number, of reactions. the number of reactions? I'm not sure what you mean. Okay, 
So strong acids, yeah, I think people have already said it, okay. Strong acids completely dissociate in solution, okay? Or we assume that they completely dissociate. So that means that we should not be able to find any undissociated acid, okay, in the solution of a strong acid. Hold that thought. Uh, if we want to find out how strong an acid is, how easily it dissociates, we use some constant. What is it? Sorry? It's basically a dissociation constant, but Hmm. Let's start with the dissociation constant, okay. So we have a reaction where an acid reacts with water, gives rise to uh, the hydronium, whatever, ion, and the acid, acid and ion, right? So what would be the expression for the uh, dissociation constant? Indeed. So the products, the concentration, the equilibrium concentration of the products divided by the equilibrium concentration of the reactants. Right? Right? Okay. Is this how we normally write? Yeah? Ah, good question. Why is there water? But normally we don't put the water there. You're correct. Huh? Well, the concentration is not one, okay? It's definitely one in an aqueous solution. But you're right. So I will say that again because maybe not everybody noticed. This is the correct dissociation constant of this reaction. But when we write Ka, the expression is different, right? We also call it dissociation constant, but the expression is a little bit different. There's no water there. Those of you who've seen it before, okay? So I will write it down. This is the usual form. This is the usual form that you see. What's the difference? Well, the difference is that we assume, since it is a dilute solution, okay, it needs to be diluted. If it's not diluted, things become complicated. But if it's an extremely dilute solution, then we can say that there's so much water there that this dissociation reaction does not really change the concentration of water. Of course it does, okay? But it changes it by such small factor that we assume that this is a constant. So we just take the concentration of water in water, okay, multiply it, and we get this. If this confuses you, what I just did here, forget about it. Okay, it's not super important for you. Okay, hopefully for those of you who want to think about it, you understand what happened there. Okay, if you don't, don't worry about it. Okay, just remember this one. Okay. What I just wanted to say, it's not really a dissociation constant. This is really the dissociation constant. Yes, it's negligible. So we can just take this to be a constant that doesn't change. It's still whatever, 55 moles per liter or something like that, whatever it is. Okay, so we just multiply it and that's it. Now. Try to find a little bit more energy just to uh, just to get through a few things which I think are important. Um, yes. So we use the left one from the no, we use this one. So from 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 your point of view, the right one. Now we've now defined a dissociation constant, or this kind of the the Ka, which is sort of a dissociation constant. <coughs> And going back to this idea of a strong acid. A strong acid, as we said, is an acid which completely dissociates in solution. Okay? That's our definition of a strong acid. Correct? Good. What is the Ka of a strong acid? No, don't, 
tell me what he memorized. Look at the expression and tell me what would be the dissociation constant, this one, of a strong acid, which completely dissociates in water. <coughs> Why would it be one? Because if it dissociates uh, completely, um, all the products will have the exact same concentration as all the products. Um, That's not true, right? Is it zero? No, the, like the reactants are supposed to be zero. Okay, so the concentration of reactants would be zero, correct? So what would be the dissociation constant? Why would it be one? It's what? It's high because the products, there are more products. No, all the reactants become the products. Correct. So it's will be more product than in a weak acid. That may be the case. Well, what do you mean absurdly high? Look at the expression. This is an equation which tells you exactly what it's going to be. Why zero? And when you divide by zero, you get zero? No, we said that the definition of a strong acid is that it completely dissociates. I mean, you're right, of course, but, but if this were true, if a strong acid completely dissociates, then it should be almost the same. No, it's not going to be the same. If it completely dissociates, and this is equal to zero, right? That there is... There is no in undissociated acid when everything has dissociated, right? Now, if this doesn't make a lot of sense to you, what I'm, just, what I'm just saying, it could be because you don't realize that these are what we call equilibrium concentrations. Those are not the concentrations that you added into your stuff, into your test tube. So you add some acid into the test tube, this reaction occurs, and you get a certain ratio of undissociated acid and dissociated acid, right? And this stops at equilibrium. And we, if we were then to measure the concentrations of these products and reactants, we would get this dissociation constant, right? Now, in the definition of a strong acid, it says that it's completely dissociated in water. What I'm trying to say is, that if this is equal to zero, if it's completely dissociated, there is no undissociated acid at equilibrium. Does that make sense, what I'm saying now? I'm not sure how I can show an, an example. I mean, this is... <laughs> no, so, for example, hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid is a strong acid. It's considered strong acid. So let's assume that you take whatever, one mole of hydrochloric acid, and since it is a strong, you pour it into water, okay? And since it is a strong acid, you, you used one mole in one liter, whatever, okay? Doesn't make sense, but let's do it that way. You take one mole of hydrochloric acid, you pour it into water, into one liter of water, let's say, okay? And you let the reaction go, this reaction go. What is going to be at equilibrium? What is going to be the concentration of chloride ions? One mole per liter, right? What is going to be the concentration of the hydroxonium ions? Huh? One mole per liter. What is going to be the concentration of HCl, of hydrochloric acid? It's going to be zero, right? Because everything has split into chloride and hydronium, right? It's going to be zero. Just one second. So, the, based on the definition of a strong acid, everything is dissociated, but that means that the dissociation constant, based on the rules of mathematics, is undefined. 
it doesn't exist. You can't divide by zero. So, the usual definition of a strong essay, which is that it's completely dissociated, is wrong, okay? But it's almost completely dissociated. Okay, because otherwise it will work, okay? You, couldn't, you wouldn't be able to describe it mathematically if, it really, if there was really, really no reactant. Some reactant always has to stay, otherwise it doesn't make sense, all right? So strong acids are mostly dissociated. Usually what you find is, I mean, you, you find these various, like that K is one or less than one or whatever, you can, you can find that uh, somewhere. But what I'm trying to say is that strong acids, in strong acids it means that the concentrations of this are much higher than the concentration of this. That's it, okay? It's not zero, but it's much less than the dissociated form. That's the definition of strong acids. And, uh, and for str strong bases, it works the other way around. Yeah? Is it impossible to be zero? Huh? Is it impossible for, the, for it to be zero? Well, yes, because the dissociation constant would be undefined, or would be infinite, or whatever. <laughs> It's, it's unlikely because all these things work on, I don't want to go into too much detail, okay? Now, of course, you can imagine, very, I'll say it very quickly. Imagine that you have just one molecule of HCl in solution. Either it's gonna be dissociated or it's gonna be undissociated. And you won't be able to describe it this way at all, okay? But we have these descriptions which are based on statistical descriptions of lots and lots and lots of uh, molecules. Okay, but of course in reality, if you have just one molecule, of course it can be completely dissociated. Because it has to be either, either completely dissociated or completely undissociated, which obviously doesn't fit into the description. So the description works with large or infinite numbers really of molecules. Yeah. Good. Huh? I think it's not practically impossible, but theoretically it would, it would, cause, it would cause problems for the description, let's put it that way. Let's, let's, let's move on, okay? We have more, more important things than, th this was meant to be just uh, an aside, really. And also, and also an aside to make you think how this really works. This is at equilibrium, okay? So these are equilibrium concentrations. And hopefully, at least for some of you, uh, this helped. Now, when we talk about strong acids, uh, there's something Maybe I should leave that out because we don't have a lot of time, but there's something called super acids. Maybe some of you heard of it, maybe not. If you did some organic chemistry, you may have heard of it. Super acids, I mean, they're not, they're not really in any way related to human physiology or to human cells, but these are some special acids which are stronger than concentrated sulfuric acids. So they're extremely good acids, okay? They really, really, really want to donate protons. Some of them are a thousand times stronger than concentrated uh, sulfuric acid. And I think the, at the time, maybe still, the strongest acid known to humans is a mixture of antimony pentafluoride with hydrofluoric acid. You mix them together, you get the strongest known acid, and it's like 10,000 times stronger or whatever uh, than concentrated sulfuric acid. It's absolutely used for organic synthesis because you can, for example, use this to give proton to methane. Which otherwise is pretty hard, okay? Huh? Well, the que there's a question, what is the pH of this? pH doesn't work here, okay? pH only works in... Hmm? It, goes below zero. it does go below zero, but it stops working because pH is really defined in highly dilute solutions. Once they're not dilute and once they're not in water, this would not survive in water, okay? Uh, then it doesn't work. And we use something called Hammett acidity function and whatever, okay? You don't really need to know that, okay? So the asking for a pH doesn't really make any sense. It's undefined here, okay? Moving on. Uh, this was just... Maybe something interesting. Um, buffers. What are buffers? In pH sense, of course. 
So there are solutions that stabilize the pH. They resist a change in pH. And this change is obviously given by adding some protons or removing some protons, right? They are extremely useful in biochemistry. They are extremely important in our body because constantly there are lots of processes which are producing protons or consuming protons. And we need to keep the pH quite stable both outside of the cells and inside of the cells. Why do we need to keep the pH stable? Yes. Yeah, but why would the activity of enzymes be damaged by changes in pH? Why, does, why do proteins denature in different pHs? Breaks the bonds. What bonds? What intramolecular bonds? Hydrogen bonds, not really. Peptide bonds, well, okay, very, very low pH. Yes, you would probably break, break those. Well, the main reason why proteins are so sensitive to pH, of course, other molecules are as well, but one reason why uh, proteins such as enzymes are so sensitive is that lots of amino acids have charged or potentially charged side chains acidic or basic side chains, right? There are some amino acids which can remove a, pro which can release a proton or they can bind a proton, okay? Such as, any amino acids that have side chains which can release a, hmm? Well, you would have to go to very, very, very high pHs for serine to remove, I mean, it's, it, it occurs, but that would not be the one I, I would mention. Huh? Aspartic acid, it's called an acid, right? Okay, aspartic acid, definitely. Glutamate, absolutely. Some basic ones? Yeah, lysine, it's basic. Histidine. So what happens if you change a pH from seven or whatever, these side chains will become protonated or deprotonated and these so-called salt bridges, and you'll talk about that in the structure of proteins, these become dissolved or changed, and that changes the structure of the whole protein. That's why they stop working, or they work differently, okay? So one of the most sensitive things in the body are really enzymes, or some signaling molecules, which with a very small change of pH, they stop working, or they work more slowly, etc. And this is given, so the sensitivity is really given by these charged side chains of amino acids. And that's why that's why it's important for you to know them, because that allows you to, to know what will happen to a protein. So uh, that's why we need buffers. How do these buffers work? Or how would you make a buffer? What does it need to contain? Weak and strong. Weak and strong acid Not quite, even though you could get there this way, probably. So, so the, the suggestion was that you need a weak and strong acid. A weak acid and strong base, you're closer, but usually we say that we need. That is true, and? And it's salt, okay? So the usual way we talk about buffers is that it's a mixture of a weak acid and it's salt. Basically, what we have is this. So we have a salt and we have the acid. Now, based on this reaction, we can easily see that what we call salt can turn into the acid by accepting a proton, and what we call acid can turn into a salt by releasing a proton, right? It's just the basic dissociation. So the buffer Oftentimes, buffer solutions are this mysterious thing where people are not quite sure what they are and why would you mix these things. Yeah, people are saying strong acid, whatever. The buffer really is just a weak acid which is sort of halfway dissociated. I'll say it again, okay? We, say we produce these things by taking a salt and acid because it's easier to mix it together and to calculate it. But really, what we have in a buffer solution is a solution of a weak acid or a weak salt, and we just have it sort of halfway 
between completely dissociating and between not dissociating, not, not being not dissociated at all. I'm not sure that helped a lot of people when I said that, because you look a little puzzled. Yes? For example, not, not, well, dissociated, you mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah, for example, that's a possibility. It doesn't have to be 50%, yeah. but some proportion of the asset is dissociated and some proportion of the asset is not dissociated. And if we have that, this will work as a buffer. Why? Because when we add some protons, the dissociated acid will start taking them up, will turn into the acid, and the concentration of protons will stabilize. If, on the other hand, we'll, st we'll start pulling protons out by some other reaction, then this acid will dissociate, will create salt, and again, the concentration of protons will stabilize. Does that make sense? Okay, this is just to really explain how the buffer works on a molecular level, really. Okay, so it's just whether it accepts a proton or not, but basically it's just the acid or the weak base, which is kind of halfway dissociated. You could, in theory, use just pure weak acid as a buffer, but it would only work in one direction. I'll say it again. If you didn't have a mixture of these two forms, and you started with an acid, if you added some protons to it, it couldn't do anything. It can't accept any more protons. Well, maybe it can, but whatever. It can't really take any more protons. So if you started adding protons, it wouldn't do anything, right? If you started taking away protons, it would start dissociating. It would work as a buffer, sort of, okay? So we have a mixture of the two forms in order for the buffer to work in both directions, to stabilize pH, not just kind of go one way. Did, it, did this make buffers a little bit less mysterious? Huh? I'm not sure what you are. So it's dissolved in water. For example, you can take a solution of weak acid and start adding some strong base. Now I've confused everybody, okay? But that's, you will get there. Forget it. If, if it confused you, just forget it. It's not a mixture of, of, of a weak acid and a strong base. Okay, it's a mixture of its salt. Yeah. <coughs> hmm? Well, it wouldn't work because it would only work one way. It would. Why? Because it can't accept any more protons. If you added more protons, it wouldn't accept them. The pH would just change. Don't worry about it. Yes. Again, that would only work one way. But then you create the weak acid, and then you have both of them. Yes, you can do that. But you have to have both of them in order for it to work. But if I just put, at the first, I just put the, the ions of the weak acid, they would create. Yes, you can do that. But for the buffer to work, do take this opportunity to understand buffers. Okay, it's very unlikely you will get anyone else to explain it to you better, okay? <laughs> so what I just want to say, if you understand completely what buffers are, okay, by all means you can go, I understand that with the uh, lecture finished, okay? But use this opportunity. Every year there are lots of students who just are completely baffled and don't really understand what buffers are, okay? so. Ask questions that try to get into what, what is happening with buffers. Again, maybe you all understand that that's fine, okay? But really take the opportunity to understand them, all right? So you could start with either the salt or the acid. It doesn't matter. But for the buffer to work, you must have a mixture of both forms. Otherwise, the buffer would only work 
in one direction. And we need it to work in both directions because we want to stabilize any kind of changes in pH or in proton concentration. Now, so hopefully it's now clearer a little bit uh, what the actual me mechanistic principles of buffer function are. Now, we use the Henderson-Hasselbach equation to calculate the pH of a buffer. And for those of you who can't really remember the Henderson-Hasselbach uh, equation or whatever, This is what it is, and you've seen it many times. <laughs> the henderson hasselbach equation is really just a rearrangement of this expression. This and this are the same thing. I'm not going to do the derivation, because that you can easily find anywhere, but this is the henderson hasselbach equation is just rearranged expression for the dissociation constant of an acid. Okay? You just put some logs in, but otherwise it's the same thing. One last thing. Buffers are best, they are buffering best, when the pH of the buffer is equal to the pKa of the acid. So, buffers have the largest capacity for buffering if pH is equal to pK. I'm telling you that that's how it is. Can you, from the henderson hasselbach equation, figure out why that is? Because both are equally amount. Both what are equally amount? Correct. When the pH of the buffer is equal to pKa, that means, which comes from this equation, that means that the ratio of the dissociated form and the undissociated form is one. There's 50% of that and 50% of the other one. That means that the buffer can easy, as easily buffer in one direction as in the other direction. It's the high, basically you have the highest concentration of both forms present, and that means that the buffer, buffer capacity is the highest. Otherwise, you can use this formula, of course, to create buffer of any pH, okay? But it's not gonna be buffering as well as it would if the pH is equal to pK. Yes? I'm not sure what you mean. Well, um, you can actually calculate that from this equation. That depends on the specific buffer. But what happens is that if you start adding more and more protons, so edit protons and pH, the buffer will, in the beginning, will be buffering really, really well. Note that the pH is going up, okay? It's, or going down, rather. Okay, it's the other way around, if you know what I mean. Um, so it's not that the buffer will stop any changes in pH. It will not. It will only slow them down, okay? And at some point, once you have basically protonated enough bits of this, the pH will just shoot up. So it's Huh? It is? Yeah, I mean, basically, it's how many of these molecules are already protonated, and once enough of them are protonated, they won't be able to protonate anymore. Okay, but it's, it's an equilibrium thing based on the equilibrium constant. All right. Uh, hopefully that helped. Yes? I have a question. Why is it a better buffer? Why is it what? Why when there is a... Because the concentration of this form is going to be equal to the concentration of this form. So it can easily go one way or the other way. When the pH is different, there's going to be more of this or more of this, and it won't work both ways the same way. All right? Okay, good. Thank you. Sorry about the, the five minutes, and hopefully it helped.